Okay, once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because I don't know when will you be visiting this video. But of course, I would like to thank you for once again giving me the chance to discuss to you the lesson for today. Okay, so just a recap of what we have studied last meeting. So it's all about pre-colonial literature. So what are these pre-colonial literature? So these are the literature being passed on by our forefathers, not written, but orally, because during those times, we don't have yet papers so that our forefathers will write on them. But we should thank them because we have something to deal on and to discuss with our era right now and we can learn really from them, okay? So the, at this moment, we're going to discuss the Spanish colonial Philippine literature. Okay, wait for a second. So the Spanish colonial Philippine literature. There you go. So what is this all about the Spanish colonial Philippine literature? Okay, the first one is there is a shift on the focus of literature. Why? Because it became centered on Christian faith, okay? So if you are to differentiate the literature before during the pre-colonial, so they are more on their observation about their environment, okay? That things happened because of the things around them. So they just prove it with the, their observations because science is was not yet born during those times. Okay, so it became centered on Christian faith. Another thing is from natural phenomena suddenly became all about the lives of saints. Another thing started to emulate the traditional Spanish ways of themes and forms in writing, including repetitive plots and shadowy characters. When you say repetitive plots, so it's just a repetition of uh, the sequence of events or the arrangement of the story from the middle, uh, from the beginning rather, middle and to the end. And when we talk about shadowy characters, so during those times, uh, there are saints, okay? So these saints were already dead, but they come to life because the, Spani the Spaniards wanted that we would learn from their lives because they are branded as saints okay and what are the forms of literature during those times okay number one is corrido okay what is corrido so corrido is a legendary religious narrative form that usually details the lives of saints or the history of tradition okay it is being emphasized already in the content or description of the Spanish colonial literature that we will be talking about the lives of saints or the history of tradition. Okay, the lives of saints would be how they really managed their lives, how they, they were being connected to Jesus Christ or to God when they're still living here on earth or the history of tradition. So here in the Philippines, we have different traditions, right? Like going to church, like having festivals, something like that. So it's like a legend. Okay? It's the starting or the bottom line of what we are doing as of today. So the next one is Awi. So Awit is a chivalric poem about a hero, usually about a saint. Okay, when we say the word chivalry, it's like, it sounds like it's being a gentleman. Okay, I'll give you an example. 
So like, for example, you're going to the market or you're going to the mall riding on a bus, then there, there is someone who went up to that uh, transportation that you have used in traveling. So like, for example, uh, an old lady. So would you be willing to offer her a seat? So that's a big question nowadays, okay? So it calls for a, a chivalry or being gentleman, okay? Another one is usually about a saint, okay? So saint before, since they are branded as saints or they were given the title saints because of some, some things that they have uh, portrayed or reflected, and that is the good side of the or the positive side of the character of Jesus Christ. Okay, next thing is, it is also usually sung and is used in religious processions. So when I was young, I, I used to witness different processions in our barrio. Okay, the next one is passion. So what is a passion? It's a narrative poem about life of Jesus Christ beginning from his birth and up to his death. And this is usually sung during Lenten season. So in Tagalog, Lenten season would mean mahal na araw. So what do we usually do when we are we have this mahal na araw or Lenten season? So of course, there will be no classes, something like that. Then many women were trained before to perform the passion. So women were obliged to be trained to perform the passion because maybe for men, it's not their forte, okay? So women portrayed it. Then nowadays, it is sung by seasoned performers in churches nationwide, okay? When we say seasoned performers, they are trained. They have given the opportunity to execute or perform the best and they are really being engaged to acting. Okay, passion. The next one is Senacolo. Okay, Senacolo is the dramatization of the passion of the Christ. So if you have already watched the movie about the passion of the Christ, it is really something that we should watch, okay, to learn the life of Jesus Christ. So it highlights the sufferings and death of Jesus Christ, and it is also done during the Lenten season, same as the Passion. So as of now, we have this, what we call San Pedro Cotud Lenten Rites in San Fernando, Pampanga. So until now, they are exercising this passion of the Christ. So if you want to witness really this passion of the Christ, you could go to San Pedro Putud Lenten Rites in San Fernando, Pampanga. Okay? And it says also here that where fervent Catholics volunteer themselves to be actually nailed to the cross to reenact the suffering of Jesus Christ. So I have a question. So since Jesus already accepted this challenge to be nailed on the cross because of our sins, are we then obliged to be nailed on the cross once more? Okay, that's a personal question. Because the only thing that Jesus wants, wants from us, okay, and it is found in the Bible that if we loved him, we should keep his commandments, okay? And from that commandments, we can see the thing to be nailed on the cross, right? So if we are truly repentant from our, repentant from our sins, so of course, we just need a genuine heart, okay? And a genuine forgiveness, our asking forgiveness from the Lord, right? So that is for a self-reflection. Next one is the Moro Moro. 
kimoro-moro or other term for it is Comedia de Capa y Espada. So this is a blood and thunder melodrama depicting the conflict of Christians and Muslims. Okay, when I say blood and thunder, it's really a clash or a war between Christians and Muslims. So next thing is, so this is usually about the battles to the death and the proofs of faith. Battles to the death on the side of the Muslims, okay? If you have already watched, there is this movie uh, that is entitled Mista, okay? So among the characters here or there is none other than Robin Padilla. So it is in the Muslim culture that if you have, like for example, because of you, one of the members of their family died. So it is also your life would be the, yes, <laughs> it would be the kabayaran. <laughs> okay. How about the other one? It's the proofs of faith. Okay. This proof, proofs of faith is on the side of Christians because we believe that without our faith, there would be no existence, right? This is very important to have because even though we are experiencing many things in life, many problems, many battles in life, if we have the faith in God, okay, there would be hope. Okay, so that's moro, moro. Next one is Carillo. So Carillo is a play that uses shadows as its main spectacle. Another thing, this is created by animating figures made from cardboard, which are projected on the white screen. Okay, I'll give you a very vivid or recent example. So here in the Philippines, we have the El Gama Penumbra. Okay, if you have watched their performance, it's really very, very fantastic and very good. Actually, they have also entered the Asia's, Asia's Got Talent, and they are among the finalists. Okay, so in that particular event, so they use also shadow, okay, but using projector, okay? But during the time of the Spaniards when they are here, so they use this cardboard, okay? And then this cardboard was, will serve as the animate, animate figures projected onto a white screen, okay? So that is Carillo, using shadows, okay? For them to capture the attention of their audience. Okay, the next one is Tibag, okay, it sounds like libag, but it's tibag, okay, it sounds like barbariotic, okay, but tibag is, this is the dramatic reenactment of St. Helena's search for the Holy Cross. Another one, St. Helena is the mother of Constantine and is oftentimes credited to have influenced her son to be the great Christian leader he is known for today. Okay, that's why we call him Constantine the Great, okay, because he's one of the proponents of Christianity. The other one is, she is also well known to have traveled to Syria, so we're talking about Saint Helena, to look for the relics of Jesus Christ's cross, the one that was used in his crucifixion. Okay, so this is really the genuine or the original replica of Jesus crossed and we have this Saint Helena okay, who have really used her time to travel going to Syria to look for the relics of Jesus Christ cross. So that's Tibag. Next one is the Duplo or Karagatan. Okay. Duplo or Karagatan are native dramas that are connected to Catholic mourning rituals and harvest celebrations. So when I say Catholic mourning rituals, it's like in Ilocano, in the tradition of Ilocano, there is Dungao. Okay. 
And how about these harvest celebrations? So before we experience, right, harvest celebrations, because in our respective barangays, there is what we call harvest festivals. Okay, and uh, this is one of the traditions we have really got from the Spanish people or this, the culture and tradition of the Spaniards. Okay, since uh, today we're experiencing lockdown and COVID, something like that. So we really did not uh, enjoy these kind of celebrations. And the next one, and I think the last will be Zarzuela. So Zarzuela is a probably one of the most famous forms of entertainment back in the Spanish era. Okay, when we say form, forms of entertainment, okay, they are used to for us to laugh. Okay, like for example, as of today, we have many forms of entertainment, like the cinema. Okay, we have also the entertainment in our own hands. We have our gadgets, our phones. Okay, we could use the any sites, including YouTube for us to watch, something like that. So they are the modern type of entertainment. But during the time of the Spanish or the Spaniards, so we, they have this Zarzuela, okay? So Zarzuelas are musical comedies or melodramas that deal with the elemental passions of human beings. Okay, when you say elemental passions, these are the, the wants or desires of our lives. Next thing is, it follows a certain plot. Okay, it's predictable because it follows a certain plot, which shows either a satirical look at society. Okay, when I say satirical look at society, so these are the something funny in our society. Okay, next thing is the grudge life. So the grudge life means these are the lives of people who belong to the low status. Okay. So in Tagalog, sila yung makina kaawaan, something like that. So that's the grudge life. Another thing is those who have uh, experienced tragic tragedy in their life. Okay. So it's more on tragic because it's sa, uh, about melodramas. Okay. For comedies, it is related to this satire or satirical look at society. Okay, how about here in the Philippines? So here in the Philippines, it is considered the third largest Catholic nation in the world in terms of population after Brazil and Mexico or Mexico. Okay, another thing about this, So at the same time, these kinds of uh, literature, so what we have just studied, also help shape the literature that we have today, not only in terms of faith, but also in terms of value system, societal norms, and realizations about life. Okay? So we, we thank the Spanish people for bringing us the, this religion, Christianity. Okay, we're in, until now, we are recipients of God's blessing. Okay, so despite being colonized, most Filipinos back then still treasured the old myths and folklores of their ancestors. And one of these is Jose Rizal. Even though he is an ilustrado, ilustrado would mean a Filipino student educated abroad, he still firmly championed the literature of pre-colonial Philippines and had also spent time researching on them. And one of his treasured literature is Mariang Makiling, okay? yes. as it is uh, projected on the, onto the screen. So it is being retold by Gat Jose Perizal in Northern Luzon. Okay. Actually, there are two scenes that we could have in this story, especially in our book. Okay, the first one is the experience of a hunter. 
So a hunter has recounted a face-to-face -face encounter with the enigma herself. When I say enigma, she is already Mariam Makiling. So why? Why did he had an encounter with Mariam Makiling? Because he was a hunter. So of course, he, he is hunting for food like the wild animals. So he was hunting a wild boar. And this wild boar just escaped his sight and went into a beautiful Nipahat. Okay, so Nipahat is like what we have today, the Bahai Kubo. Okay, and that Nipahat was a house of Mariang Makili. Okay, and of course, Mariang Makiling uh, asked him if what was he is searching for. Okay, and then he he told Mariang Makiling of that wild boar. Okay, and then of course, since Mariang Makiling was a very hospitable person or lady, so he, she invited this young man if he could serve something for him okay and even though he, he is not requesting for something so maria makiling served him a porridge okay porridge is a soup kind of soup and then after the conversation she or maria makiling gave him a parting gift okay she filled the peasant hat called salaot with yellow ginger. Okay, so salakot would be in the knitted hat, especially for farmers. Okay, so we could see the knitted hat for the farmers with a yellow ginger. And then, so to continue the story, so while he, he was uh, traveling, going back to his home, I'm referring to the hunter. He was able to do like since this thing went heavier and heavier, so he chop it up, or yes, and then he put he throw it away, he threw it away. Okay, and then when he was already in his house, okay, so this is what happened. So what happened was this yellow ginger turned to a gold, okay? So the hunter regretted having thrown away a few bits of ginger gold or gold along the way. So that's really what happened when sometimes when we are experiencing things like yeah. We can't we can't really deny the fact that when we are already in a problem, so to escape from that problem, we need to lessen it. Okay, so that's what happened to the hunter. Okay. So the next scene or setup is the story of the farmer. Okay. What is in the story of the farmer? So the story of the farmer. So Maria Makiling is said to be more than compassionate. Okay. So he's uh, once there lived a young farmer who always seemed to be blessed. His fields were never touched by any calamity, and his livestock were always in good health. Okay, so the people of his village say he is endowed with a charm, or mucha as it is called, that protected him and his and his from harm. Okay. Will they know that, that this farmer okay, was with Mariang Makili? Okay. And then there was there came a terrible time for him and his family and war had come to his fair land 
and army officers came recruiting unmarried young men who were in perfect health. So what did his family do? So in order for the farmer to escape the, the duty of, be, of being a soldier, so his mother arranged for him a marriage with a beautiful daughter of a wealthy family. So upon finding this out, the young man became more sullen than ever. So he visited Mariang Makiling's wood one last time, a few days before his marriage. So Mariang Makiling lent him a dress <laughs> and some jewelry for his wife to wear on their wedding day. I would that you were consecrated to me, she said sadly, but you need an earthly love and you do not have enough faith in me besides. I could have protected you and your family. So this having been said, she disappeared. So the young man went back to his village with Maria Makiling's gift and presented them at once to the girl he would marry. But the girl did not care for Maria Makiling's gift. Instead, she wore the pearls and dresses her mother had handed down. The ending? Okay. Maria Makiling was never seen the peasant again, nor was her humble heart ever rediscovered. Okay, so learning about Filipino folklore and myths is important in our information as a citizen of this country. So this story show, show us what values were upheld in society before up to now. For example, in Mariang Makili, the values of honesty, loyalty, and generosity are pointed out by Mar Mariang Makili, who trusts people. Okay, so until now, we're being, we're very blessed as Filipinos because we still have this brand as hospitable people. Okay, so that is our brand not just here in our locally, but also globally and internationally. And I hope that as we go on with our life, we should be that person whom the society can trust, whom the society uh, will look up to okay? because we are being honest, being loyal and being generous to other people, okay? And I hope that we have a good and productive uh, discussion for this video. And uh, I'm expecting you to be with me once again to our next module. So we're moving on to module two, which is poetry of the archipelago. Okay, so I hope that we have learned many things today. And uh, I am very sure that if you will be encountered later on internationally, you could portray yourself as a Filipino. So good day and God bless everyone.